Okay. <clears throat> Steel at ordinary room temperatures is a cubic structure with one iron atom at each corner of the cube and one in the dead center. So these are steel molecules? No. No. No molecules in steel. Crystals, atoms, no molecules. I can't remember the difference, but Rick gets all cranked about it. Yeah, that's a compound. Yeah. Never mind, I'm wrong. That's all right. Rick's a little pedantic. We're gonna fuss about him right now. Okay. So anyway, you got a anyway. Face centered or body centered cubic. Body centered cubic. One on each corner. One in the dead center. These are all iron atoms. Carbon can't get in there. When you get it hot, it's face centered cubic. There's an iron atom at each corner, but now there's one in the middle of each flat face, and the cube is physically bigger. And those are carbon atoms? No, those are iron atoms. But now the spaces are big enough for the carbon atoms to wiggle in between. Okay. And get trapped inside. <coughs> On the way up in temperature, it absorbs energy to make this shift happen to face centered cubic and get bigger. On the way down, it gives off energy, thus the color change getting brighter when it changes from face centered cubic back to body centered cubic and it expels the carbon atoms and the friction and movement is what causes the heat in the exothermic reaction. Okay. <clears throat> when you take this face centered cubic and quench it, it wants to freeze in that shape and the carbon atoms can't escape as much and then it becomes what they call a... what is the right name for that? <clears throat> Actually, you'll get the book. So you cool. So you overload that thing with carbon. So you yeah. cool, you cool this so fast. The right. carbon can't get out. Okay, so this is kind of the same theory that hot air can hold more moisture. More carbon yeah, than exactly. Air. It's a solid it's solution. Okay. Just all the, the carbon can dissolve in this, but it can't dissolve in this because there's no space for it to get in there. Right. Okay. Got it. So once the carbon is in solution and in between the iron atoms, when you quench it, I think it's called close pack tetragonals. But it distorts the square, it distorts the cube a little bit, and everything's really highly stressed under a lot of tension, which is why it's really hard and kind of brittle until you temper it. And when you temper it, some of the carbon gets kicked out as tempered carbides and the distressed bulged cube relaxes a little bit, it loses a little hardness, but it's a lot tougher. So you're saying it takes carbon to make steel hard? Yes. Okay. So, so where it all is already there, it just takes small particles spread out through it. You lost it. <laughs> he said, well, he the, said this carbon is still <clears throat> here, but it's just in bigger pieces. Well, is there, is that's no, they're individual atoms. Is there any carbon in here at all? Very little. Okay. Oh, it's in between. The rest of it will be out here on the boundaries between this and other adjacent cubes. Okay. Okay. And a group it's, of cubes. Steve, it's just their spatial relationship relative yeah. to one another and the other atoms. A group of cubes is what constitutes a grain. When we talk <coughs> about grain size, so what is a carbide? What carbide? Okay, well, for, first off, so that's a grain. That's a grain. It's a this grain. is a grain a collection of cubes. cubes. Yes. Or these. Yes. Collection of cubes. Collection of cubes. Okay. Right. That's why. If if it's if it's body centered cubic and low carbon, 
or no carbon, there won't be any carbides. If it's high carbon and in body centered cubic form, having <clears throat> been cooled slowly and not quenched, right. the carbon exists out here on the grain boundaries between this grain and the next grain as a little film. So and there may be discrete particles also scattered around throughout depending on how you anneal it or how you cooled it. So when the these little guys, spermies on the outside, and when you get it hot, them suckers jump in. <clears throat> Absolutely. Congratulations. So when these guys blend I'm steel gonna and carbon. carbon. I'm getting that out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> and I get to put it on YouTube. Right. Maybe. So the, the, the <laughs> when, when these guys blend steel and carbon, a meeting of ours, they heat it up and it kind of blends together. <laughs> Do they let it cool slowly? In, in making steel? Yes. So that's if it goes if it goes if to lick from mostly by water, water or oil, 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 and it's got a spout in the bottom, and the liquid comes out and solidifies yeah, you don't get the little things out. caught in your throat. No. And then they run it right in. Did I mention I'm filming? <laughs> in old steel, big steel, America's steel. industrial grade age oh. practice, they took the steel and poured it into a giant ingot mold, and it took six days to cool. Hmm. Okay, so that just kind of blends the carbon and the steel. Well, that all happens while it's liquid. Okay, but our process is wham. Yeah. Making the carbon stay there, making it hard. Right. Okay. Uh, it, it opens up this, this year. Yeah, the cube gets bigger, and, bigger and, and another iron atom jumps in on the face instead of just one in the middle. And the one in the middle moves so. to a different location when you go from body center to face center. So it takes like four body centered ones to make one, or maybe not right, two body centered ones to make one right, face centered one. You've got four, eight, together. nine atoms, and here you've got four, eight, twelve. Okay. Is that right? Four, eight, and then six more faces. Fourteen. Well, that'd be yeah. fourteen. This is just a bigger version of that, right? Yeah. Because it's hot. 14. Yeah. Exactly. And it can hold more carbon. Exactly. There are specific numbers about how much carbon can go in each. Fourteen. <coughs> fourteen. So nine to fourteen. Yeah. So that's one and a half of a small yeah. You said you had a copy, John. Uh, well, here it goes into a bigger. It's actually the one I sent. <coughs> it's on your nightstand? What? Did you say it's on your nightstand? That's kind of precious. <laughs> so, so what actually is it? I understand the way the carbon moves and the different grain structures, but you, you always hear this has big carbides. This has, yeah, I, I don't understand what a carbide is. I don't mean to sound stupid. Um, well, I have to go back and you know review the technical description, but it's essentially iron and carbon in specific relations. It's like, you know, water is, is two hydrogen molecules and an oxygen molecule, right. and there's just only certain amount of space on that oxygen to accept two hydrogens. You right. can't have. Um, I mean, you can manipulate chemistry to get like an H3, so, so you know, or an H2O2. So, okay. But there's there's additional energy okay. and change that has to be put in. So, you know, water exists in a natural state. Iron exists in a natural state. You right. know, heat it up and it wants to. If you deoxidize it, and, and then normally iron will hunger after oxygen quicker than it does carbon. John has better <coughs> pictures than I do. <laughs> That's a face centered cube, the way he draws it. And you can see the. Location of the carbon atoms, sir? No, that's an yeah, iron. Yeah, iron. 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 <coughs> no, there's little dots. Are they the carbon or? No, that's, those are the, those are the iron, iron atoms. 
and then the these are the center the corner. of the hole. The, <coughs> hole. the circles are the center of the holes between the iron atoms where the carbon can get in. So they actually fit in between. Got back up. Well, we got to back up. Yeah, we got to back up. Clear, clear back to page one, basically. <laughs> There's the body centered cube. And this is a collection of them that makes a grain. And here's the grain and another grain with a grain boundary in between. Yeah, and, they can and the carbides will form preferentially on the grain boundaries if you have an excess of carbon and cool it slowly. Like with uh, W1 or W2, this 1.1, 1.2% carbon. If you put it in the fire and get it really hot and cool it really slowly, there'll be an almost continuous film on the grain boundaries of iron carbide and it's brittle, even though it's soft. And a meal. Yeah. And, and that's generally an undesirable condition. But that's where the carbon goes mostly is in the grain boundaries. And until you trap it in here or otherwise deliberately change the microstructure to anneal it or spheroidize it or something else. But it, this is this is really the best book of its Kind so, they say sphero, say the word. Sphero diving. Sphero. Sphero diving. Sphero diving. When, when, when they say that, mm -hmm. does that mean all the carbons is congregated together? Yes. Okay. In the little ball. Okay. Sphere. Yes. Okay. And they can be they can be regulated in size and distribution by time and temperature. Oh, you could have different clusters of them, different, different And you make them uh, different yeah, sizes. Okay. If you, if you, like your, when you buy brand new O1, right. it comes mill spheroidized meal. If you make a stock removal blade from that, you have to have some soak time at temperature right. because the spheroidal carbides are big. Right. And if you don't soak it long enough, not enough of it will dissolve in the solution to give you full hardness and they'll still be big when you quench it. Okay. Then your matrix will only hit like say 50. Okay, that's what you, okay. So you soak for five minutes. Yeah. Okay. If you've been forging the bar and having it out of the done. fire a bunch of times, yeah. you don't have to worry yeah, about that. Okay. okay. How about that? So don't carbides know. are in between the grains. Or spheroidized, or sometimes within the grains, if you're making perlite, that form is a plate of pure iron ferrite, another plate of iron carbide. And there's pictures of all of this in here. Well, okay. Is that on Amazon? I don't know. No, no. Charlie? I, don't on I don't, this is the classic illustration of perlite. The dark areas are pure iron, and the light areas are iron carbide, and all of the carbon is in those plates. That's the, the normal air-cooled, soft, condition of a high carbon steel. Like if you just put 1095 in the fire and cool it in still air and watch it do what we just did, that's what it looks like under the microscope, a collection of little plates. And you can drill through that relatively easy provided the carbide plates aren't real thick. <laughs> What does this look like after you quench it? Uh, something else. <clears throat> we're, we're working right through the... Okay. 1045 air cooled from 1560 to room temperature. That's a misprint. 
No, let's say maybe not. Not Austin Light Grand, it would be Ferrite Grand surrounded by Perlite Grand, not Austin awesome. Okay, I got this for you. What? This is actually a and it still hasn't sunk in. from 1560. Well, there's, that's not labeled right either. I wonder if he knows how many typos there are in this. These are all martensite. This is the hardened structure. Looks like a pile of little needles. <coughs> Victor was talking to me about that yesterday. How many times? Yeah, I'll back up on the molecular discussion. They call it, everybody in here calls it a compound. Yeah. Um, but there's three, three iron molecules in the carbon. In which structure? Um, iron carbide. Otherwise known as semi-carbide. Yeah. Normally classified as a ceramic. Uh, yeah, that's a compound. Then. I guess I can't... Uh, I thought molecules were organic. Yeah. <laughs> and since steel is an inorganic material, that's crystals and... Oh, well, I didn't do well in the interview. But, you know, it's a, a, it's a pedantic distinction at this point. Yeah, it, it naturally retains small, very small, spheridized carbides in the matrix even when you quench it and make martensite. Because in order to dissolve all of the vanadium carbides, you have to like 1800 degrees. And we don't do that with the computer. What does that do to the brain size? Yes. But what does it do to the brain size? Oh, it, it prevents the grains from growing because the little spheroidal carbides don't dissolve. Okay. So it, it pins them in place so they can't grow because it's not hot enough to dissolve the carbides. Alright. My, my main interest is in the smoothness of the edge for the comfort of the shape. Okay. In addition to, if, if we could find it and you wanted to go with pure martensitic structure with no carbides to speak of and we're after the slickest possible edge, you'd want something that was like 0.78 carbon with no alloy at all. Alright, okay. Does the vanadium uh, add to the strength, the durability? Okay. It makes it more abrasion resistant. It'll be a little more difficult to hone, but it'll also stay it sharp longer. Okay, that's right. That's why that's, that's why O1 works well because it's got carbides in it that increase the wear resistance and make it stay sharp a little longer. Okay. Just a high carbon steel. From a strictly chemical point of view, yes, but it doesn't make the same structures. Different structures. Yeah, cast iron is a whole separate science. Just because of all of the excess carbon. It, you always end up with graphite in cast iron because there's so much excess carbon, it comes out of solution and makes a little graphite. So either plates or spheroids, it can go either way. So within that structure that you describe, <coughs> There's just a finite capacity for iron, for, for carbon. Yes. Just finite. That's yes. It. And, yeah, and that, that's all well known and well established, and it's all in there. I, 
Not, I don't remember where to find it. Okay. So the excess has got to go someplace. Right. And it, and it either pops out on the grain boundaries or it exists as undissolved spherical carbides, depending on how you do it. Now I have a book to read, a serious book to read. So I can All right. learn something. Hmm? No? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've, I've read it and waited around and read it again later. And I've, I've read I've chapter read one four or five times. Yeah. Each time I'll get a little yeah, bit. relatively. In a Rothwell C scale it is, yes. It can range anywhere from about 15 to 20 Rockwell C up to 45 with some high carbon steel. Um, and Woops blades actually cut better in perlite than they do in Kevin Martin's thing. Uh, there is one process patent that exists with, under John's name, and I, I think Alfred's got a piece of it too, I don't know, okay. I'm not exactly sure. But it's a slightly different process that, all, that allows uh, Rick Fuhrer to make it? I don't think Alfred's ever pursued it because the patent was filed primarily <clears throat> in the eventuality that there would be an industrial application for the technology that would use large volumes. And Rick produces very small volumes and very few things. And it's no, no big deal. No, yeah. Okay. okay nobody who's making loops is producing commercial volume in terms of the steel industry's point of view. And that's the reason the patent was filed, is in case it found a real industrial application, they'd be able to collect the loyalty of them. So absent that, it's just not worthwhile to go after anyone for... Yeah, okay. more or less. Yes. Well, they've chosen not to, actually, would be the more accurate way to say it. Okay, well, that's good. Well, I can wrap this up. Does anyone want to say Happy Valentine's Day? Happy, happy Valentine's, Valentine's Day. Day. 2016. Mm -hmm. Let's hear that one. <laughs>